Welcome to the Filmlings Podcast, a pseudo historical podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 148 Westerns 101, The Silent Era. That's right. We're going to be doing something a little different this year on the podcast. Yeah, changing up the structure a bit. Welcome to Filmlings Courses. Uh, we're going to be doing these. Uh, Get your notebooks out. Your number multi- two pencils. Yeah, multi-part series where we do really deep dives into genres. Uh, we've kind of been doing uh, more thematic episodes over the years, and this kind of gives us a chance to go deep and broad at the same time. And yeah. Cover both a genre and uh, figures within that genre and their biography that's significant to it. Um, so yeah. we're starting off with westerns, uh, which should take up pretty much the first half of the year. Yeah, it's going to be uh, a wild ride. So buckle in. And uh, but westerns, there's so much westerns that we've already talked about westerns. We did an episode. We did a breakdown of Three Ten to Yuma. So um, you know. There's all kinds of stuff that we've already talked about, but we keep coming back to this this history of Westerns as like Westerns being this really pop genre in the early days. And then it influences uh, some of the Japanese greats. And then it comes back to the West with like spaghetti Westerns and stuff like that. But we've never really looked at that full trajectory. So that's what we're going to be doing over the next like five months uh, or so. We're going to just trace the whole thing. But uh Let's start out with just kind of an overview of how the Westerns got started. And today, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through the overview, and then we're talking about the films that started off the genre back before sound, when it was just an easy thing. We're still learning how to make movies. Westerns are exciting, and they're also timely, which is really crazy to think about. But in 1920, which I think is the earliest one of our films, um, and some of the films we're going to preface with are a little earlier than that. Like some of these things are super, super relevant. Um, and we're going to watch the genre kind of take on its own mythology as it goes from something that's, uh, almost straight from the headlines to something that's, uh, almost like a, a legend or, or complete fantasy. Um, so Alex, how did we get started with, uh, Westerns? Well, it's easy to think of the Western as a typically American genre and a historical, if exaggerated, one at that. But the truth of the genre is far more complex. It's comprised of layers of films and directors and stars from all over the world, built slowly over time like the layers of sedimentary rock. Like the Grand Canyon. Like the Grand Canyon, exactly, which we will be flying into with a plane later in this episode. Uh, Eat your heart out, Tom Cruise. (laughs) <laughs> the Western has been constructed a legend and international from the get-go, and yet ask nearly anyone and we can summon up a universally familiar Western shootout scene in our minds. It's set somewhere in the American Southwest, filled with dust, wooden saloon doors, and at least one gunman named after a true historical figure. How did the Western become what it is? How is it so complex and yet so identifiable? How can it be made of tall tales and legends and still be relatable to so many worldwide? To understand this complex and simple genre, we'll have to start with some of the first Western films ever to exist, which were made just as the age they supposedly depicted was coming to a close. The first Western content recorded ever to the medium of film was done at Edison's Black Maria Studio in New Jersey, um, which was called such because it was like painted in deep black tar um and they used a literally they had no roof on it the uh the black walls and the no roof were to get that striking contrast of extreme light that was needed to actually expose very early film um it notably featured western performers that were at that point removed from that setting even though they were historical to it and recreated the western uh, or a sense of the Old West within a constructed film studio for the first time. Uh, Edison very famously invited uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show to um, to come to the studio and perform. And that included uh, famous performers like Annie Oakley, as well as uh, members of uh, va- various Native American tribes, including the Sioux tribe, who performed with Buffalo Bill's show um, and did traditional dances for uh, the Edison's uh, cameras at the time. 
It's ironic because Buffalo's Bills, Buffalo Bill's life was very much a Western at one point, and as we would think of it, up until the point that he actually became a legend uh, with a traveling show depicting his life as a historical Wild West figure. And at that point, he kind of became more of a showman than an Old West man, no. um, even as he kind of embraced the idea of depicting his Old West hood even more. And that kind of idea of both depicting and aggrandizing the West would kind of become fundamental to the idea of the Western as a whole. The first narrative Western film itself was surprisingly British. Uh, it's called Kidnapping by Indians. It's from 1899, and it was shot in Blackburn, England by the Mitchell and Kenyon Film Company, who were basically a couple of dudes who um, had heard a lot of stories about the American West from uh, people who had gone, uh, English people who had gone to America to work and had come back. Um, international film releases weren't quite a thing at this point in 1899, uh, but folks like Buffalo Bill and writers of Western dime novels had made good trades spreading the legend of the Wild West, and it made its way into British film at this point, which is unsuspecting, but it just proves that Westerns became international almost from the get-go, yeah. um, as it was based more on the legend than the actuality of what happened. Um, and the film is only a minute long, and it is a very, uh, at this point, very cliched and outdated Western story, but something that would be very typical of the time, which is a white girl gets kidnapped and then saved. Uh, story. I love how you could fit all that into one minute. It's like the original TikTok. Yeah, yeah. It's also assumed that the uh, the film was actually quite a bit longer than it currently is, um, yeah. but a significant amount of it was lost. As, Which is an important point when we're talking about the types of the types of films that we're talking about today. And we'll get into all that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, back in Jersey, the Edison Company had been making non-narrative Western films, either actualities, what you might call a documentary or something approaching a reenactment um, in the early days of film or staged anecdotes for nearly a decade. Um, Edwin S. Porter, working as a cameraman, a role that at the time was combined with uh, the role of director, uh, had access to foreign films being part of the company. And he had been watching a lot of European uh, filmmakers who at the time included those like Georges Millet uh, and his Trip to the Moon, as well as a very uh, successful group of filmmakers out of Britain known as the Brighton School. They had been uh, experimenting with and implementing uh, narrative shooting and editing techniques for the first time uh, in film's history, kind of like developing the idea that film wasn't just about recording what happened in real life, but uh, you could use it to tell a story that only existed within the world of film, much like a stage play. Mm -hmm. uh, and he set to work making The Great Train Robbery in 1903. Sure that, and this is a quote, that a picture telling a story might draw the customers back to the theaters. And indeed, narrative storytelling was blooming into big box office business. And it's important to note that at this point in time, and kind of through all periods of time, filmmaking on a large um, industrial scale, like the Edison Company was doing in this period of time, even though that's small potatoes compared to now, was all about business. So the, the art is very secondary, especially when we talk about a lot of these early Westerns and silent films. It's all about what could we do to make the most money at the box office. And that was very much where Porter's motivations were, if you look at how he discusses these films. Um, and he was also very much in the business of uh, learning how to direct by copying other people, which is honestly how we all do it how anybody learns to make a movie is kind of by copying other people. But he very directly uh, ripped some of his uh, films and their structures from other filmmakers. His other really famous work at the time, the first, quote, American narrative film, Life of an American Fireman, was actually done off of the template of one of the Brighton School's films called Fire! with an exclamation point at the end. Um, so if you're interested in making something, Start by copying the stuff you like and introduce your own originality into the uh, the end game there. And then it's basically apparently, its own genre of movie now. Exactly. And if you're making a, if you're doing it the Edison way, don't forget to make copious amounts of money. <laughs> and if you're also if you're doing it the Edison way, never be involved in it yourself. Pay other people to make the movies, slap your name on it, 
and take all the credit. That's how it's Edison did it. Also a genre it. of movies today. Also a genre <laughs> of movies today. Very much so. Um, in addition to the massive surge in popularity of Western stories at the turn of the century, the Wild West itself wasn't quite dead at this point. For instance, when Butch Cassidy robbed a Union Pacific train, that was in 1900, like three years before the release of The Great Train Robbery. And Bill Miner did the same to an Oregon Railroad train a few years later. As weird as it may seem, a train robbery film was really topical and we should also mention that trains themselves, super popular at this point, both in pop culture and in, um, in, uh, in, in film. It was kind of like the Wild West and steampunk were really big right then, except they wouldn't have called it steampunk. They would have called it cutting-edge technology. Right. I, I uh, saw an anecdote of John Ford that when someone asked him what brought him to Hollywood, he said the train uh, which is appropriate for him. So <laughs> it's very accurate <laughs> and a good answer. The the more I the more I am alive, I should say, the like the older I get, the more I understand why you would answer press questions like that. Right. <laughs> at a certain point they're just redundant. It's and, just a game. It's just yeah. yeah. Yeah, they just they just want a press bit to 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 print. So give them something and make them go away. For the bones of the Great Train Robbery, Porter selected Scott Marble's stage play of the same name because, of course, Wild West stage shows were very popular this time as well. Like we and said, there's a lot... He was lot. good at copying people. Oh, yeah. He's good at copying people. Hollywood is is famous for just adapting stuff. It's been... We complain about it now, but, like, Hollywood from the beginning was about adapting and copying. It's never yeah. not been. Uh, I feel like you get a pass when you're just starting. It's like, well, we already have a bunch of stage stuff, but now we've had film for a long time. So anyway, that's not the yeah, point. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And there's different motivations. Like right. the reason that, that these guys are doing it is because they're not storytellers. They're, right. they're technicians, really. They're technicians. They're engineers who are slowly becoming storytellers. Like the role of director wasn't even a thing at this point in time. Which is kind it, of the it, story just, of the films we're talking about today because we're going to hit one of the biggest auteurs by the end of this episode. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, one of the big themes we're going to be talking about today is how like the art of the Western and kind of film in, ge in general is almost an accident. <laughs> it, yeah. Well, it pretty much is an accident. It was never intended to be an art form. It became that way on accident. At first it was just a product that was being sold by Edison at his little like, uh, five cent Nickelodeons and stuff. And now it's, it's huge, big business as well. But we've also come to think of it as an art form because people got really good at it and turned it yeah. into an art form. Uh, but this is just the early days of people tooling around and, and doing stuff like that. Um, and speaking of art, the film itself wasn't super inventive compared to a lot of other stuff. Like we said, it was kind of copied from a lot of other things. Um, to kind of create the Edison version of this product to sell. But the cutting does do some stuff like play with temporal space by allowing action to happen across multiple locations simultaneously with intercutting between scenes. And of course, the final shot of the film is quite memorable by breaking the fourth wall and having the outlaw in the wanted poster turn, face the camera, and shoot at the audience, um, which is still a pretty cool shot to this day. Uh, very on the nose, but very fitting for kind of the whole like feel of the uh, of the film. In the early 1900s, fleeing Edison and his patent lawyers, many enterprising filmmakers set up shop in Los Angeles, as we've mentioned many times before. Early cameras needed a metric ton of light to work. They were slowly getting better. Emphasis on slowly. Um, and LA is sunny for 300 days out of the year, which makes it a great location. And in addition... The city is surrounded by miles and miles of dusty hills, mountains, and valleys. And considering that, along with the demand for Western content at the time and the supply of Western dime novels and stage plays to adapt, it's only natural for the Western to become one of the most popular genres of the silent era. It was, in a lot of ways, and we'll, we'll get into this as we talk, we kind of explore it. In a lot of ways, like most Westerns that you find, the, of the ones that survive, it almost feels like the superhero movie genre of the time. It was like the big yeah. thematic box office draw. Sometimes there's some deeper storytelling in it, but for the most part, it's like, 
you know exactly what you're getting when you go you in. You want to see just, people ride horses and shoot guns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And quick disclaimer before we uh, talk about our films for the day. Um, according to the Library of Congress, roughly 75% of all silent films no longer exist. Uh, so our selections for this episode are based both on the filmmakers that and stars that we wanted to cover uh, within this era, as well as cross-sectioning that with the availability of their surviving canon, um, because there's just not that much left. And again, a large part of that is because at the time, uh, films were disposable. There are products that were sold when they were timely, and after a certain point in time, you didn't really replay a film. You might re-release it once or twice, but at a certain point, you audiences just wanted the new thing. So the yeah. old thing went away in a storage locker. And like most studios at that point in time, and even up until like the 50s and 60s, when once TV became a thing, this really changed. Um, yeah. But, but in, in the an early era days, of they just theater, never it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, a theater show plays and then it's over and no one ever sees it again. So. Yeah, it's ephemeral. It's ephemeral. But a lot of that early film either dissolved into vinegar or went up in any number of like a dozen studio yeah. vault fires because early film was super dangerous and super flammable and they just kind of threw it in a cement like <laughs> locker and then left it. And then it just Gave takes the like one an sunny intern. LA day for it to ignite and that's it. Yeah. But yep. seriously, go on any studio tour around LA uh, and that studio will have at least one plaque up somewhere <laughs> commemorating a vault fire that destroyed a bunch of movies. But of the films that we have remaining to us, we have chosen uh, three to talk about today for this early era that are going to kind of work us up into the next episode. Uh, but we're starting off with The Testing Block from 1920, directed by Lambert Hillier, starring William S. Hart and Eva Novak, written by Lambert Hillier and William S. Hart, cinematography by Joseph H. August, edited by Leroy Stone. And then we'll be talking about Sky High from 1922, about a group of high school students who find out that they have superhero powers. Oh, I'm okay. Sorry. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that Disney Channel movie came out when I think we were in either middle school or high school. Yeah. And for whatever reason, it just really stuck with me. I, I don't really know had why. to throw that in there. There's no way around it. Okay. Sky High from 1922, directed by Lynn Reynolds, starring Tom Mix and Eva Novak. Are they both starring Eva Novak? Yes. Yeah, Eva oh, Novak is our sleeper that. our sleeper hit third western star of the day. Okay, there you go. She's pretty cool too. We'll we'll talk about her. I have a I have a block written in there for. Her. <laughs> All right. Written by Lynn Reynolds, cinematography by Benjamin H. Klein. And finally, we'll be talking about The Iron Horse from 1925, directed by John Ford. Starring George O'Brien and Madge Bellamy. Written by Charles Kenyon, John Russell, and Charles Darnton. Cinematography by George Schneiderman. Edited by Hetty Graybaker. And that one is going to set us up for a whole lot of John Ford. Spoilers. Yeah, yeah we're like we're like a dramatic, episodic, like either a comic <laughs> book or a banga or uh -huh. a, like a, a, like a action TV show where... You know, we introduce the next main character at the end of the chapter. John Ford makes this big epic. Will he become an international sensation? Stay tuned to next month to find out. My gosh, the, uh, the I, Iron Horse is just like miles ahead of the other two films. It like it's caught not even me fair. so off guard. Like as I was watching these, I've been really busy. So I'm like, all right, yeah, these are each like an hour. So it's, you know, pretty easy to work in after dinner kind of thing. And then the iron horse was like two and a half hours. I was like, Oh shoot. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very, it was an interestingly like, like some merry, like American epic of the time. It was trying oh, to like yeah. very much like embrace all the ideas of what like being American was. Oh yeah. 19, 20 something whatever strong david lean vibes uh we'll get there but first let's talk about the testing block from 1920 jason take it away the testing block from 1920 sierra bill is the toughest member of the outlaw gang but their leader ringe is the meanest when a passing troop of performers is abandoned by their managers the outlaws throw down for the chance at pursuing the stranded music star nelly 
While Ringe has some unpleasant designs on the poor woman, Sierra Bill wins the fight and very quickly marries Nellie. Years later, Ringe returns to spoil their family's happiness. You can tell that that William S. Hart put himself in this movie because he does not look like a Western guy. He looks like his character halfway through the movie, the family man. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's a pretty accurate way of stating it. He is um he became a, a big Western guy, but he did not start out that way. Um he was originally a traveling stage actor and actually a uh, moderately successful Shakespearean stage actor in he both looks Asheville, like North that Carolina <laughs> and Brooklyn, New York before um before uh, moving out to LA getting involved in short films because that was almost everything was a short film back then, one or two reelers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, eventually becoming obsessed with the West and going all in on that. Um, And that's kind of his background. Um, He did research, everything old West kind of fell into essentially what would have been a really popular subculture at the time or a part of pop culture would have been learning about reading about, both the Old West, its history and its stories and its biography. And he actually became friends with both Wyatt Earp, the famous lawman. Although after having read a little bit about Wyatt Earp's past, lawman is a generous term. Um, <laughs> I mean, but, we're talking about the wild, wild West anyway. So, yeah, this was the part of the wild West that was actually quite wild. There were characters like wild Earp and um, his fellow deputy, Bat Masterson. Uh, who both became friends with William S. Hart. Uh, to explain it a little bit, at that time, a uh, with the popularity of Westerns that had occurred uh, between the end uh, or uh, the arrival of uh, film shorts with like the Great Train Robbery up until the 1920s, by the time Westerns were big business, um, the uh, the last kind of like wave of lawmen and gunmen of the West were still alive. They were old but still alive and were frequently employed by Hollywood as consultants. So that's how Wyatt Earp became friends with both William S. Hart and Tom Mix, who we'll talk about in the next movie. Um, But yeah, William S. Hart was obsessed. He even bought Billy the Kid's six shooters. um, And he kind of was well known. And you can even see in this film, like you're saying, Jonathan, he was involved in everything. He is decidedly uh, an auteur actor he was involved. I mean, he has a writing credit on this. Um, he he doesn't have a production credit, I don't think, but he was basically a producer. Um, the idea of like the more modern producer didn't really come around to like the late sound, the late um, silent era, early sound era, uh, when we really think of what a modern day producer is in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but he was basically a producer on it. He helped with the design. He helped with the costumes. Uh, or at least had input on all of this stuff to essentially inject, and this is kind of the hilarious part, a sense of realism into his films, Um, which is interesting because it is a genre kind of removed from the essence of realism that he kind of tried to ground it. But um, it does, you you can see where that comes through in this movie, I would say. Yeah, um, there's, there's a sense of that. But again, it's just he he feels like the most out of place thing in the whole movie, which is really funny. Um, But you kind of I don't know. At at the beginning, I was like, you he does not look like the tough gang leader. He definitely uh, looks like, you know, as he kind of gets into his, you know, after he steals the girl, you know, like our uh, our (laughs) our one minute film (laughs) stolen uh, steals the white girl. But this time he actually, you know, he he does a King Kong. He, yeah, or he Beauty and the Beast himself somehow. Um, but anyway, he, uh, yeah, then there's this whole, you know, the whole backbiting, like uh, the the other guy who took over the crew comes back and gets him thrown in jail and all this stuff, um, which is just like classic. The plot is pretty classic um, and it still kind of holds up to some extent. Um, but it is, it's kind of ham-fisted. I love the, uh, the part where he... They sh- they skip like ten years or something, and they show that he's like a great father, and that and the inner titles have like these clouds with the sun bursting through, and it's like every man hits his testing block to see what he's really made of, and it shows that he's like, oh wow, 
the the outlaw with the heart of gold, you know, so it's playing on the whole Robin Hood uh, themes oh, yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the um, it, it, the <laughs> the na- the name of the movie and that inner title feel a little forced to me, but like I get yeah. what they're driving at. A lot of these, they feel like the they feel very lofty, you know, like as even though it's like a genre film, you know, these films feel like they're reaching for ideals. And I don't know if that's uh, compensatory or if it's, you know, they're actually trying to do, you know, something really big. And then I don't know if it's just that it's it's you know, looking back on it through history, it doesn't feel that big, but, uh, they're definitely trying something. I mean, the next one, it kind of like starts right off the bat as like a showpiece. Like we know that the film is to show off the Mm -hmm. Grand Canyon and stuff like this. Uh, but this one, and especially the iron horse, I think the iron horse is kind of the culmination of these kinds of ideals. And then John Ford's like, here, watch how you actually do it. Yeah, the Iron Horse is much more like thematically developed. And yeah. I think to explain what you're you're getting at with the history of the Western um uh pop media, which started in, you know, storytelling, traveling shows like Buffalo Bill's uh exhibition mm-hmm. or Wild West show and uh Dimeback novels. That th- that's a huge part of it. Uh, mm-hmm. is that a lot of that was built around very I don't want to, you know, I, I will say simplistic and to a definitely a large extent reductive, like morality plays. Uh, yeah. Cause and sometimes that's just storytelling of the era and often of like very simple pop media is like, there's one message. It's very simple and they just kind of ham it up a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that is part of the DNA of Westerns. And, and sometimes it works. Like I, I feel like when we get into the golden age of Westerns more so in our next episode, but a lot of times it is that stark black and white kind of morality yeah. play, but Quite it literally hasn't black really hat, caught white its hat, foothold cowboys. yet. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we're talking, you know, we don't, we're, we already did a whole episode on 310 to Yuma, but even uh, like uh, High Noon, you know, films like these are, you know, you know the point and you kind of get it throughout the thing, but that's also kind of what makes them great. But these, they're like working for that, but they haven't totally nailed it yet. Yeah. And, and part of it too, is that, you know, William S. Hart was all in on trying to make this the best thing or he was trying to enact a vision with it. Right. Yeah. But this is also the era where William S. Hart in the studio he was working with would pump out, 15 movies in a year. Right. So, so a lot of these are, you know, when we are simple intentionally because they're quick to make and because they're easy to make and because you're not spending years in development on them to flesh out those themes. You're basically cranking out, you know, one a month, if not more than that a month, you know, it's something like, um, it's like throwing spaghetti Westerns at the wall. Yeah. I mean the stat I remember because there were a bajillion stats like this, but the stat I remember was Tom Mix's number. Uh, like during the entire decade of the 1920s, he made 80, um, he made Holy. 80 Western movies. Most people don't make even 50 movies in a lifetime nowadays. <laughs> right. Like movies take so long to make and we're used to like. It's like <sighs> while he's doing one scene, there's cameras from three different studios filming him and just cutting it into different plot lines. Well, almost, almost exactly. Like, I don't know if if you've seen some of the old, um, uh, it's reenacted in some, uh, some movies. I think the best example I can think of it is in the, um, the, the movie where Robert Downey Jr. plays Charlie Chaplin. Uh, Oh yeah. But the old Chaplin, I think it is called Chaplin. Yeah. But the old, uh, the, the original movie studios, in Los Angeles, not Black Mariah out in New Jersey, but in Los Angeles to take advantage of the natural light. They didn't mm-hmm. really have a roof. They maybe had some mesh nets that they could put up if they wanted to diffuse the light. But uh, it was basically just booths. It was like giant cubicles. Yeah. And there was, there was no sound staging because there was no, there was no sound stage. And everything was just going on 
at well, this once, is appropriate at one too. time. They they do that in uh, Blazing Saddles, right? Yeah, Where I was about to bring that up. Yeah. And they just keep walking through different genres of movies, one, like one studio at a time. Yeah. So if you've ever seen that kind of like gag play out in Blazing Saddles or elsewhere, that's kind of where it comes from. Now, this one specifically, Testing Block, um, was mostly shot on location in Capitola, California, um, which is actually how we have access to this mm. film. I'm sure there's other ways to access it, but the Historical Society of Capitola actually has this up and kind of has like a little like mini documentary intro at the front of its of With some uh, classic 2000s edition. PowerPoint. Ooh, very much <laughs> like Ken's the PowerPoint Ken Burns esque stuff going on, but it, it is informative and it kind of shows how uh, how this movie was made at the time in that location. Um, which is interesting, right? Because while the themes of this movie, like the morality play, the the black and white of it all, kind of feel like something you'd find in a traditional Western, the location itself is very woody and is not like the grandiose, uh, like big it's not monument, like Man- valley. monument valley, yeah, yeah, or Grand Canyon esque area that we would eventually become associated with the Western. Now, I mean, the American Southwest has a wide range of biomes in it and geography and uh, uh, plant life. And, you know, you'll see something different in Flagstaff, Arizona compared to Albuquerque, compared to the Grand Canyon, compared to uh, Sacramento or the central coast of California. Uh, But of course we are, are, we are kind of looking at this through the lens of a more, uh, of 19 or 2020, not 1920 after the John Ford era of shooting in monument Valley, where that yeah. just has become the definite definitive image of Westerns, but it wasn't always so, um, you know, this is a earlier time period where people were just using all of the space around California to shoot Westerns and it was all out West. So you could do it. Um, Griffith park in California was a very popular place to shoot Westerns up until relatively recently. Yeah. Oh, I I remember one other thing about this. Um, There are kind of different archetypes when it comes to the Western genre. This is true in all genres, right? Um, You have different archetypes that exist within the genre. I mean, think about horror. You have different killer archetypes. You have different victim archetypes that you think of. Well, you have the classic fantasy archetypes, which is what the whole hero's journey is based on. Yeah, that's an excellent one, Jonathan. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, the classic hero's journey, which is a thing you do see pop up in uh, Western movies a lot, especially once you get to John Ford movies mm-hmm. um, that exist here. But it feels like, you know, there's a couple different types of leading men you can have in Westerns. And I feel like with this one, you kind of see William S. Hart almost as a prototype to like the brooding, quiet um, yeah. leading man who will almost out of nowhere have like a surprising act of sometimes heroism, but often just violence. And you'll, it almost feels like a run up to uh, future actors who would become Western stars. Uh, predominantly the ones I thought about when it came to William S. Hart were like Henry Fonda. Yeah. Um, who was a famously um, not talkative actor and Clint Eastwood, another famously not talkative actor who would be silent and just stare at everything for 90% of the movie yeah. and have one action scene where he kills everybody. And then that's <laughs> it. Well, his character too is, again, speaking of films we've talked about before, in 310 to Yuma, when you have Glenn Ford's uh, villain, who also is kind of, he's almost an anti-villain in the way that we think of anti-heroes as uh, our protagonist that sometimes does, you know, shady things, but like in 310 to Yuma with Glenn Ford's character, he's the villain, but he sometimes does redeeming things. And that's kind of what this is. It's kind of dialed up to 11 here, but it's kind of the villain who is not fully villain. And we all, you know, we all want to root for that kind of guy. So there's that kind of archetype too. Yeah. There's, um, there's, I think there's part of the audience that wants him to reform, there's yeah. part of the audience who, and I think you have this anytime you have like a very more realistic setting or a very more realistic story. Um, if the audience can't identify completely or doesn't want, maybe doesn't have like the strong urge to identify completely with this lofty, righteous 
you know, goodness, uh, then they might have this empathy for uh, the outlaw, for the renegade, for the one who doesn't fit the mold. And yeah. I think you see that in William S. Hart's character here. And the female uh, lead plays a big part in that, too, with Eva Novak, because, oh, you know, for sure. again, it is that kind of Beauty and the Beast. Like, she's the one that, you know, changes him and, like, finally makes him make that choice. It was Beauty that slayed the Beast. Exactly. But, I mean, we've talked about before when we've covered um, a crime film and a gang film from the 1930s, uh, like Scarface and some old... Um, Oh, what's his name? He's the song and dance man who's really good at playing mobsters. James Cagney. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Cagney. Yeah. Was, he, was, he was just a Broadway guy, but he, apparently he was just really good at playing mobsters, so he became that guy. There you go. Um, you got William S. Hart as the Shakespeare guy who just decided yeah. he wanted to do westerns. Yeah, exactly. Um, but essentially, you know, this is, you can see in this, this movie and kind of like the anti-villain role that, uh, anti-villain, anti-hero role uh, that William S. Hart's character is playing where he's an outlaw, how that the focus on outlaws is a trope within the Western genre could lead to, you know, eventually becoming the crime genre. You know, it's essentially taking the outlaw story and transplanting it into 1920s, 1930s big city. Yeah, I was going to say, all you really have to do is move it into a city instead of out in the wilderness, and it's like the same thing. Yeah. And that's a big part of what we discuss when we discuss about genre are these, you know, we think we know what genre is, but genre itself is a pretty elusive idea. Um, we know it when we see it and we, what we're trying to do here in Westerns 101 is break down what is it that we're seeing that we makes us know it's a Western, mm-hmm. you know, and how did it become that way? And, and the interesting and, thing is like in, in that regard, the testing block in Sky High and even the Iron Horse, to some extent, they don't feel like what we think of when we see a Western. You know, if we're watching a trailer for a Western, we expect to see certain things. And the testing block and Sky High don't have a lot of those things. So it's really interesting to see how we've kind of gotten to this point where some things are almost, uh, um, you know, irremovable from Westerns that weren't mm-hmm. always landmarks of the genre yeah yeah and of course you know in in as genres develop people like to deconstruct them and oftentimes what they're doing when they create a quote-unquote deconstructed western is just scaling down parts of it to reveal these pieces of genre that we're trying to examine here um and i think when we compare testing block and sky high which we're about to get into what you're seeing is two different sections of the genre kind of take shape in testing block i think you see more of the themes um, yeah. and the character tropes and like the the morality play take place and sky high which has almost no focus on story or plot <laughs> has like the setting and the action um and some plot elements but plot is a generous term for a lot of the stuff that happens in that movie um, yeah <laughs> which is not to bash it some movies just don't are, are just exist to be visual, visually fun <clears throat> avatar and don't need a story <laughs> to back it up. And maybe that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess in terms of like hallmarks and stuff, I don't think this film even has a, a shootout or like a, you know, a duel. It's no. it literally hinges on um, Hart's character, his son, who uh, is like dying and then his wife has to play this beautiful tune to which ironically they have to get the kid to fall asleep for him to live. Usually you're trying to not have them fall asleep anyway. um, But it's, it hinges on that, that family emotion dynamic more than the, uh, the rivalry aspect, which is also kind of interesting. Yeah. 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 There's like the, the, that one of the striking things and you, you mentioned it a little bit, Jonathan was how, a lot of the visual elements of the Western are just missing. Like there's, there's a gang of outlaws. They don't really do a lot of shooting. There's a sheriff at the very beginning. Who's kind of doing like a high noon bit where he's like, I can't stop him because nobody will help me. Yeah. Um, but after I think, yeah, that, I think they do like, like one robbery where they just point a gun at the guy and he hands over all the cash. And that was pretty much yeah. it. 
the other, the other, the only part that felt super like westerny to me was when he was in like the dusty jail. Um, oh, the other it, thing is the all the outlaws get in a in a fist fight, and he he fights every single one of his crew one at a time. So I guess that's oh, yeah. one of the big things. And then yeah, the dusty jail. Yeah, yeah, but no no real no real shootouts, no big horse chases. Um, even the setting, like we talked about, this is shot in Capitola, and it is technically a western setting, but it's so piney. Like, and I literally mean <laughs> yeah. like filled with ponderosa pines that it doesn't feel like that typical Western setting that even though the Western, the West, like we said, it has a more diverse biome, isn't the one that we always associate with the Western pop media idea of like the wild West versus the actual like frontier era, um, which had yeah. already become legend at this point. And at this point, essentially what's happening is Hollywood's just iterating over it so many times. They're just layering up uh, different entries into this legend that it's becoming almost unrecognizable from what it came from. Um, and that's kind of what I meant when I mentioned, I think a bit earlier, that the West Westerns in the 20s feel a little bit like superheroes now, where it's just like the most popular thing ever and people are making like 5 million superhero genre things and we all recognize yeah. bits and pieces of it and people are trying to invent on it and it's almost becoming a white noise with how much stuff there is and i'm sure by the time the fad fades away it will uh it, it'll still be around it just won't be as popular as it was at least mm -hmm. for a while probably until they start making you know throwbacks to the the old superhero films exactly <laughs> deconstructed superhero films which they already kind of do sometimes but you know, just if you want to see like the same like era of genre formation that we're that we're talking about with Westerns in the 1920s, looking at superhero movies in the 2010s and 2020s is a pretty comparable yeah. comparison, I think. But anyway, we're starting to drift into overall now. So <laughs> let's move right. on to Sky High from well, 1922. Unless you have last, something else. Yeah. One last little shout out here. Um, I'm sure you saw this tidbit, but since we covered the frozen North on the bonus podcast, there's a fun thing. So Buster Keaton made a two reeler called the frozen North, which was a parody of Western films that came out in 1922, which is the same year that this, uh, no, which is two years after this film. But that film is a parody specifically of, uh, William S Hart films. Um, and I think it's funny because when we watched that, I didn't see a lot of the trademark Western, you know, tropes and things in that short film. Uh, mm -hmm. But now I'm kind of seeing where that idea of a Western came from, which was a little bit different when Buster Keaton was parodying it than the things that we would typically parody now. Um, so anyway, that was a fun two reeler that I'll put a link to. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, it, it definitely explains a lot. And also they have a, uh, it makes a lot, a lot of sense now because William S. Hart has kind of a long face and, Buster Keaton yeah. also has a very long face. So that actually makes a lot of sense. They're also both the pretty silent people. It's a good idea for a parody now that I think about it. Although William Hart was not very happy about it uh, and uh, I'm sure didn't not. talk to Buster Keaton for like years afterwards. Yeah, I kind of looked a little bit at like William S. Hart's like interaction with other stars and it doesn't seem like he got along with a lot of them. He could hold the grudge pretty quick is what it yeah, seems. Yeah, he kind of seems like really one of those spoiled celebrity types. Like I'm just going to buy these guns from uh Billy, the kid, and I'm going to put myself in movies and get mad when people make fun of me. He was very serious about his own art for better or worse. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was involved in every bit of it. And um yeah, I mean, it definitely creates a very unique feeling and he was, he was a very big name in the twenties for a reason. So um, if you're interested in the uh, the origins of the Western, I recommend also checking out more William S. Hart films. There's not a lot that exist anymore compared to how many were made, but a lot of the ones that are are in the public domain, so you can probably watch them for free wherever you can find them without being worrying about the internet police. So yep. Go check those out. All right, Jonathan, on to Sky High from 1922, the first Disney Channel movie. Jason, take it away. Sky High from 1922. Grant Newberry is a deputy inspector of immigration at the U.S.-Mexico border. Newberry is asked by his boss to go undercover to investigate a coyote ring operating out of the Grand Canyon. 
Meanwhile, Chicagoan Estelle Holloway follows her roommate out west for the holidays. Deputy Newberry's undercover operation becomes exceedingly more difficult and action-packed once Estelle falls, quite literally, into the middle of things. Um, so when we talk about Sky High, we have to talk about Tom Mix because it's decidedly just kind of the Tom Mix show, which is every Tom Mix movie. Um, but Tom Mix, the person, uh, was the son of a stable master and was kind of a Western character in his own right um, to some extent. He, he was a farmer. Uh, he served as a soldier. He was a ranch hand and even developed into an expert uh, horse rider and um, marksman and won like national riding and roping contests and stuff like that. So he was a certified cowboy before he even joined the movies. And in fact, some of the first movies he were he was in, he was hired to basically perform as a cowboy extra. Um, and there was even a very early docu- documentary of sorts or an actuality, as it would have been called at the time, um, of his work on a ranch in Oklahoma. But... After he uh, he started working with movie people, he had it. Whatever it, it was, charisma, massive athletic ability, and a giant hat. And <laughs> people were like, you're <laughs> in. Um, and he, he became a giant, giant movie star. Like, certifiably huge at yeah. Fox. He's if the guy William who made- If William S. Hart didn't look like the leading man, this guy does look like the leading man. This is like the traditional leading heroic action athletic man um, type here. Uh, He had a signature 10 gallon hat, which makes him really easy to spot in silent movies. And, you know, we've talked before, Jonathan, about the um, the white guy soldier problem where you put a bunch of white guys in the same outfit and you, you stop being able to tell who's who. And you have to really work against that in terms of like cinematography, character design, and performance when you're doing a movie to keep them distinct. A good example of keeping them distinct, for instance, is Saving Private Ryan. I feel like all of the characters are pretty distinct in that movie. It's fairly easy to follow who's who. Or even like Black Hawk Down, in which all the characters are big names and you still don't know who they are. I have no idea who anyone is in that movie. (laughs) It kind of works for it in a way, but it kind of doesn't work for it either. But it definitely is a problem. But that was the first thing that I thought when I saw... um, Tom Mix's giant hat was he picked that because it makes him easy to spot in, in two reelers. And that was kind of where he got his start. Um, and you know, if you get enough people asking who's the guy in the big hat, Oh, he's Tom Mix. You become a star. It's a pretty smart strategy. He also had a very famous horse named Tony, the wonder horse who appeared in a lot of his movies as well. Um, and was very good at helping him perform stunts. Um, and like, every other Western person in the early uh, Hollywood era, he became friends with Wyatt Earp as well. And you can even find like this really fancy picture of a gold pocket watch, super ornate, but it pops up every time you uh, look at Tom Mix and Wyatt Earp together, their like friendship as a gift that Tom Mix gave Wyatt Earp because Tom Mix was stupid rich um, by the time he was, he was in the movies in the 1920s. Um, but yeah, like you said, Jonathan, this is the athletic, strongman, heroic archetype that we'd see, like literally does all of his own stunts. Um, a comparable actor who was already famous, but really starting to get into his own like big epics, including Westerns and um, uh, more exotic uh, epics was Douglas Fairbanks who was like the king of Hollywood at the time, who did all of his own stunts and was just super athletic, doing flips and jumping off things and climbing things uh, around, almost like he was literally a monkey climbing up the set. Um, And then probably like a more golden era comparison of the talkies would be, um, would be like a John Wayne type in terms of like being big, being strong. John Wayne would often play more complicated characters. I feel like that's probably a side effect of him appearing in both John Ford films and in a more developed Hollywood that was telling more complicated stories. Yeah. But he definitely kind of fits more in the, uh, I think, the Tom Mix heritage of uh, stars than in the William S. Hart heritage of stars. Yeah, definitely. But, I mean, the modern-day equivalent is 
as you've already alluded to, Tom Cruise, where he is climbing up the mountains. He is rappelling down ropes. He is hanging off of airplanes. Like, yeah. this, this is a <laughs> set piece movie. Yeah, yeah. The the airplane, I think, might be one of the few stunts he didn't do on his own. That makes sense, because that's uh, nuts. Insanely dangerous, yeah. Especially, uh, like, they don't have... I mean, they barely had airplanes at this point, and <laughs> they're already doing stunts off of them. Yeah. I mean, honestly, after... Th- some of the most impressive stuff in this movie is some of the most, like, unassuming stuff that just, like, shows off stupid amounts of strength and, like, physical fitness. Um, I think the thing that really got me is, like, that dude is in shape is when he picks up uh, Eva Novak out of... Uh, the water after she's fallen into uh, the canyon and she literally does fall into the canyon uh, and just walks up the wall of the canyon like there's it's it must have been like a 50 degree grade but he just walks right up it perfectly upright carrying a full-grown human in his arms just right up it and like having gotten into hiking around the southwest region of the united states in the past few years that's hard. <laughs> like a 30% grade is hard. A 40% grade is hard. Carrying another human up like a 45 or 50% grade like he was doing is insane. Like just like the amount of physical strength that required is stupid. And you and then it just makes it easy for him to do all the fist fighting, all of the running around, climbing up like a bajillion ropes up and down the Grand, Grand Canyon. Yeah. Like literally rock climbing the Grand Canyon at points. Um, jumping off of stuff, you know, doing all this crazy stuff. And that's kind of the central part of the the movie. The idea of the movie is let's go to the Grand Canyon, let's get one of the biggest stars, most athletic stars, and just have him climb around and jump it, and we'll just kind of make up a story that sort of gets him into that place, and that's basically all I can really say for the story. Well, I will it say exists. it's, it's, I mean, it's a lot more lighthearted than the testing block very, because again very, it's very. not really like focusing on the themes and all that but what it kind of gave me vibes of was almost getting into like screwball territory but not quite almost like um uh the 39 steps where you have this instead of a mystery plot you have some kind of just random action plot but you have the interactions between him and the girl which are a little cheeky and they're a little fun and playful um, and he's doing this kind of double play on the the bad guys and this kind of stuff, um, which kind of, you know, even like charade, you know, you've got that kind of dynamic between the uh, the guy and girl lead. Um, so it's it's more fun in that regard. And I think even Novak has a little more to do, even though she got to save her son with the violin in the last movie. But there's a little more focus on the play between them in in some of those scenes yeah like like even when when he brings her like a dress in on on one of the cliffs where he's hidden her in the uh grand canyon and he puts up this blanket on a string and it's it's almost like the walls of jericho and it happened one night so like those little kind of hints yeah i mean there there is definitely like a case for like mistaken identities um to a certain extent undercover agents um misdirections uh and definitely like the the action itself feels a little very lighthearted and comedic like you were saying so i can see the case for that yeah just in in terms of in tonality this is again it's all focused around the the action it's more fun it's more of a entertainment than a uh tearjerker it's not even trying to be a tearjerker it's just fun. Like it's just big and fun and crazy. Yeah. And honestly, the stunts are so like dangerous <laughs> in parts, especially with the plane that like even now in like, I love how they just, they didn't even bother to set up the plane. They were just literally at the yeah. end, like, and then they had to get there quickly. So they used a plane and look, we're hanging off of the plane. There is an element to it that feels like a five-year-old telling a story. Yeah. Uh, like, and then, and then, and then they got in a plane. And then, and then, and then he jumped into the river. <laughs> well, it even starts off that way. The beginning titles where it's like, 
This whole thing was shot in the Grand Canyon. Here are some fun facts about the Grand Canyon. It's yeah. 2,000 feet and, you know, the, the highest point is 9,000 feet above the sea level. The Grand Canyon is awesome. And I was even thinking, like, you know, to some extent, this is the first almost documentary of the Grand Canyon. Because before, you can't just Google the Grand Canyon. Some people might not even know about it. And so it's kind of cool that they're showing off this like huge landmark of America, but also just like playing around in it. It's like it's again, to your point, it's like when we were kids and if there was like some fun thing in the neighborhood or like an abandoned shed somewhere and we're like, we're going to go like make a movie with this abandoned shed because it's there and it's different. Uh, it's like that. But with the Grand Canyon. Yeah, it's it's literally just a, sh- a show piece of like stunts, um, which is really cool and really fun. And like speaking of the Western genre. You know, it's all of the action that you come to think of in the Western genre, except for the plane. The plane is really yeah. out of place in terms of like the Western genre. And it seems like reactions to it at the time kind of even called that out where people are like, this is not realistic. <laughs> I don't know what you were expecting with the Tom Mix film. They're not going to be realistic. It's like saying Avengers isn't realistic. Like it's not, it's not going to be. Um, but it's it's definitely just fun and they were like let's put let's put him in he's got a big hat let's put him in the canyon let's have some horses let's have some shoots shooting out shooting out things um let's have some uh, sneaking around and sneaking up behind people and stealing their guns and all sorts of like espionage type stuff although yeah. all of the spy work seems to happen off screen there's just like one inner title that was like after a day in the canon he found the evidence yeah, he needed he got all the information like, thanks for telling us that <laughs> i was like okay cool um uh, the uh they needed a dam- damsel in distress to complete the archetypes they were working with there was kind of a story that got her into the canyon and of course you know spoilers a bit uh she's connected she wound up being connected to the uh, big crime boss. Um, but they just needed to get a woman in there somehow and they found a way to do it. Yeah, uh, I love how the crime boss like is also just fostering this woman who's going to school at a boarding school somewhere. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, she was now she's a graduate. Yeah. Now she's graduated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's a bit crazy. Uh, but I will say, Shout out where it's due um, to Eva Novak, who's been in both of our films so far today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she wasn't in as many films as Tom Mix or William S. Hart, but she was in a lot of Westerns during the 1920s. And she actually got in to doing her own stunts too. Uh, she worked with Tom Mix on 10 different films and she did a lot of her own stunts, including I believe some in this film. Um, and she even uh, went on to marry one of the stuntmen who she met on uh, on a production. So she was all about the stunts. She kind of faded out a little bit, well, almost entirely, once the silent era came to an end. Um, but credit where it's due, sliding down the wall of the Grand Canyon is not easy. Yeah. yeah. So quite impressive in that feat. And I just looked it up because I was curious, but I cannot tell from Wikipedia that she is related to Kim Novak, which I thought would be interesting. That would be interesting, but I don't think so. I don't think so. All right. Well, shall we move on to The Iron Horse from 1925? Yes, let's. The Iron Horse from 1925. At the dawning of a new age, the government, companies, and many an enterprising man set out to connect America's east and west with iron and coal as the Transcontinental Railroad is built. Davy Brandon's father found a shortcut that could save the Union Railroad a significant amount of money and time, but he was killed in front of young Davy's eyes by a mysterious two-fingered man. Years later, as the rail construction approaches the shortcut, Davy once again runs into this very same renegade. I kind of like that this is sort of a biopic in a way, but only about a um, only about a railroad. It's a biopic about a railroad but it's a really funly done biopic about a railroad. Funly, is that an adverb? It is now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's fun, but it's also intense. It's also, like you're saying, it's got the, the drama. It's got um, 
you know, I, I really just can't stop thinking about something like Lawrence of Arabia, like something that's just huge, uh, especially for the time period that is covering a lot of plot. It's covering a lot of themes. It's covering a lot of characters um, and it works it all in and somehow ties it all back to the railroad and then ties that back to America coming together. And it's just like he checked all the boxes on this one. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely about like that time there are so there it's it's very well devised thematically um and they're very upfront with it at very at, at the beginning like they they hit you with the themes very early on top of Just, with, I mean, within our titles <laughs> you got abraham lincoln up in there yes. before he had oh, yeah. a beard you know yeah i mean there's the idea that like uh, I do like the Abraham Lincoln like cameo though, where it's like, is that Abraham Lincoln? Oh my God, it is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> um, but I do like the idea that there is this theme in uh, about like the American West that you see in a lot of the culture where, uh, because the era, the great era of the frontier, if you want to call it that or the old West or whatever, uh, kind Manifest of came, destiny. It really, yeah, it really sparked when, uh, after in the period after, the um, the Civil War, which was kind of heralded by the uh, the creating of transcontinental railroads, um, and it's a period about reunionization and really building the whole country as a whole to be more interconnected, and um, which plays off well, especially in a movie that is definitely seems to be aiming itself at defining like an American identity, even down to like the idea of being a melting pot. One of my favorite bits of it. When, especially when it's not ham fisted, when it feels more natural, is when all of is all of the uh, different nationalities of immigrants on yeah. the um, on the railroad, whether they be you know fifth generation English Irish Irishmen, you know the ones mm-hmm. that you know call themselves Americans but are also descended from immigrants, or the newly uh, come Europeans, or the newly come uh, uh, Chinese workers who are all working on the railroad together. Uh, who start to just get along and be like, yeah, we're in this together. We're just yeah. we're building a country together. They're all singing their working songs. That's really cool. That's really, really cool. Also, just side note, but those Chinese workers on the railroad, uh, some of them were, for starters, some of them were the original workers who worked on the railroad and basically came back uh-huh. to work on the film because they thought it would be fun. Um, and then also that is like the origin of Chinese American food. Uh, Because it was just a bunch of dudes who came over who traditionally did not do the cooking um, where they came from. And they were just trying to emulate like their original cooking. But they did it with like way they just essentially they just fried the crap out of everything and they put a lot of sugar in it. And that's how you get like Chinese American food. And I really, really love it because it's a uniquely like American expression of uh, of culture is to essentially like. It comes. It comes over intact, and then morphs through the 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 filter of Almost generations of, of living in a different country yeah. and necessity and changes. It's like how like you know American pizza isn't the same as like original Sicilian pizza, but it be, has but it's become its like its own, its own really cool thing, right? Yeah. By the way, I learned all of that on a wall in Panda Express. So read <laughs> the walls, and of course, because the American frontier is a big place. Um, and America is a, div- a diverse place filled with so many different people's stories. Uh, John Ford and the writers on this film do a pretty good job, actually a pretty amazing job, of shoving all those stories together, intermixing them, and somehow having them make sense yeah. um, together. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of plots working together. There's the uh, like six different railroad plots, like down to individual characters on the railroad. There's the romance plot. There's the uh, Igneo Montoya plot. <laughs> yes, um, it's straight out of Princess Bride. Or it vice really versa. is. It's amazing. But yeah, I mean, in terms of covering all the different plots, this is kind of the original. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, which I feel like we've talked about before, but this was oh, yeah, kind it's of a good a, concept. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the classic idea that if you've got a lot of things going on, you kind of leave one storyline at an interesting place. And say, meanwhile, back at the ranch, I think this was famously kind of used by George Lucas when talking about how he structured Star Wars, which is going back and forth between the space stuff and the Tatooine stuff in the original film. Um, But that's what this film is. You've got both like 
the east and the west of the railroad coming together. And then you also have this buffalo herd, which feels super random for a long time until it becomes the deus ex machina uh, at the end. Uh, it's Chekhov's but, buffalo herd. It is Chekhov's buffalo herd. But the fact that they've been showing us like we've got this food coming and we know the food is coming. It kind of takes it out of the realm of Deus Ex Machina because it's not really coming out of nowhere. It's just the timing is a little too perfect, but it's also kind of it. By the time it gets there, it's almost played for comic relief. Um, But you do have like, I mean, the 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 buffalo and the cattle herds also are just giving more than they're playing into the plot, but they're also playing into the sense of just the fact that this is an American film. You know, you've got the East and the West. You've got the South with the Texas cattle. You've got the Buffalo from the North. Like you've got all of America mixed in here somehow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just the scale is really crazy. And like any good epic, um, you know, like any kind of good David Lean piece, it's long, but it doesn't feel as long as it is. Yeah. Uh, which is good. And you can even tell, like, especially coming off of watching uh, Sky High, which was fun, but kind of brain dead. Um, mm-hmm. Like this movie was just so easy to watch compared to <laughs> compared to Sky High. It was I such think a if relief. they had focused on any like the, the fact that they have so much going on and that they keep it all so clear and distinct helps with that. Because if it was just the revenge plot it would really take a long time to get there because we kind of yeah. know that Duro is the guy for a while oh, because yeah. he never is showing his left hand um, and then or his right hand, whichever hand it yeah. is that has the two fingers. But he's um, also got the evil fur coat on. Don't forget that. <laughs> right. right. But it's the, I, it's I mean, the evil cape of the 1920s. There is there is a really confusing aspect when he shaves his mustache and also takes off his brown face. I don't know what was going on with that, but uh, anyway, he he changes appearance as his whole like undercover evil mischievous thing. Yeah, um, he's a weird he's a weird character. He and is a you really can, strange character. You can you can tell that like the intent is just to have him be evil, uh, right? Yeah, I could see. Speaking where you, of archetypes, he's he's almost literally a mustache twirler. <laughs> He's, he, yeah, that's what he uses his two fingers for. Torlin his mustache. Um, which, actually, speaking of which, I think in one shot, he's missing a different set of fingers. Like, it really threw me off. Really? I, yeah, I yeah. couldn't actually tell if it was a prosthetic or not, because it looked really good. I couldn't tell either. I thought maybe they got a hand model in or something like that, because they don't really show the hand that's in the true. wide. Um. And in the wide, normally he just has his hand in his pocket. Um, but yeah, he's he's definitely just a mustache twirler. You know, especially because uh, he's such a big name, John Ford often gets uh, cited as one of the origins of um, some problematic depictions of Native Americans in the Western genre. Uh, and I could see where you could view that here. But I would say, I would argue that if anything, the Native Americans in this film, especially as they interact with um, uh, with Duro, aren't given a lot of agency. They almost just feel like a force of nature, which yeah. in a way out, is problematic because it is stripping them of agency, but also like it's not a negative pejorative at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. It's unique. It's, and they I do saw, have the two different tribes. They have the, the Pawnees that are, you know, working with the white people. And then they that's have actually the, uh, a good point there. They showed that there was that, uh, one of the, the more impressive depictions was that it was showing that they were not a monolith that yeah. it was. And they literally of, saved of the day at the end people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's complex. It's not as easy as you would think it was to make a judgment off of this, but mm-hmm. that is kind of the point is that America's too complex to make a blanket judgment about one way or the other. And yeah. I feel like this movie actually reaches that point of explanation quite effectively. Uh, so it's, it, it can be very tempting to make judgments about things, be black and white, but they're not, it's complex. And this movie does a good job of diving into that complexity. So are we assuming that, Duro is half Native American and half white. 
So uh, from exactly what I saw sure. about the literature surrounding this and all the stuff I've read, the intent is that he is entirely he's he's supposed to be fully white. The um because he's already a landowner in this county out west, and based off his name, it's kind of implied that he was one. Uh, he, he comes from like this essentially French trapper stock would be my guess. Mm-hmm. After all the Louisiana ter- territory that is essentially the, this territory that is now being having the railroad bit built through it was originally a Louisiana colony. Um, that's how he could have already have been a rich land owner in this obscure uh, county out West that most, um, most of the uh, American populated center on the Eastern coast would not have really been a part of. Um, yeah. So I think the, the, the idea is he's a mustache twirling treacherous Frenchman who is manipulating uh, this Native American tribe to do his dirty work for him to make uh, to make the railroad business as profitable as possible for him. Yeah, of course, it's not really specifically dived into, but I think that's intentional as well because if you get too deep into his complicated machinations, it becomes all about that, and the film is too big of a patchwork, I think, to really spend time diving into that right you need to kind of just get the the ideas although again when we're speaking about westerns the climax of that of that plot line is a fist fight more than like a duel so we're still not seeing a lot of those really classic tropes although we are getting there because we've got a lot of john fordisms um, that are going to turn into more of the stuff the duels and stuff like that but we have a lot of tracking shots on horses which are always so awesome i oh, love the action is shots. impeccable it's yeah. so cool i mean one of the coolest uh one of the coolest scenes in my opinion was like the early one it's it's pretty early in the film uh where the 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 train car carrying uh the the pay to the rail workers oh yeah was ambushed it's and the, like yeah they they get away on like a push cart like the one guy climbs up a pole to send a message and gets uh-huh. killed by an arrow like in the middle of sending the message, like it's all so dramatic. And there's a lot of one of the That's most one of the scenes things. that makes me think of Lawrence of Arabia because there's a train, there's a there's a train ambush in Lawrence of Arabia with the Arabs. Uh, yeah, and it's almost it's almost identical. I think it's very clear. John Ford is one of those guys who just kind of was so good so early in movie making that like everybody pulls from him, and I think yeah. David Lean definitely falls into that category as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Cuz he would have come he would have come up almost at the peak or right after the peak of John Ford. And I mean that's yeah. going to be the point of a lot of this series. So not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but we are kind of working our way up to that with everything this film. influences everything. I mean, yeah. like think about the intro of this podcast. We talked about a period in American history that quickly became legendary as people from that period started selling the idea of it at the end of that period. Then that, uh, that genre became so popular that people started making movies about it to make money. And people in Britain started making narrative movies. <laughs> and then people in, about the Old West in America. And then people in America saw those movies and decided to make their own narrative movies. And then Hollywood happened and they started just making a bunch of them to make money. And yeah. now we have somebody with actual talent like making these really, really big movies that are brilliant in the genre. So it's crazy and influential and everything stacks on top of it. It's turtles all the way down. Everything stacks on it, man. So everything is influenced by something. Nothing is original, but that's okay because if anything, that shouldn't dishearten you. That should embolden you to go make stuff. You'll find your way to make it original if you practice on it. It's just about how well you can puree it, really. But yeah, this... This movie has just so many characters. Yeah, um, I mean, it even has, it's got the comic relief. It has like these Three Stooges-like characters. Yeah. Um, which actually, they killed off one of their comic relief characters, which I thought was pretty genius and and ballsy because not a lot of uh, modern films do that. Uh, but Yeah, there were stakes in this movie. People die <laughs> a yeah. lot. I think one of the things I think one of the only things that they don't really wrap up is the whole Jessen storyline. Did you do you remember what happened to Jessen? I think he just disappeared. I think he just runs away. I think it's just implied he just bounces, which is kind of a fitting in for him because he's just a coward. 
Yeah. Like that's, that's his whole thing is that he's a coward. And so he leaves, um, after I guess being that found would out be, being a coward. That's almost the, the gun duel. There was supposed to be a gun duel, but our main guy promises not to fight him. So he puts his gun down and then Jessen tries to shoot him in the back and then it turns into a, a fist fight. So it's like, yeah. we start off with a duel and then we subvert it into a fist fight, which is almost a meta parody of a Western while Westerns are still becoming something parodyable. Honestly, the idea uh, now that all these all these westerns have had fist fights in them, I think one of the big reasons for all the fist fights in sound in the silent era is because a fist fight is much more appealing visually. Vis- yeah, that's true. Than a, sh- a gunfight, and a gunfight is so based on its sound. Yeah, and like you can do so much with a gun sh- where where you're seeing the gun versus where you're hearing the bullet and all sorts of stuff um, that you just can't do in the silent era. Now there were silent gunfights that does exist, but I think that might be an explanation for it. Also at the end of that Jessen fight, Miriam, uh, freaking Miriam. Oh my gosh. I do not like that character. She kind of sucks. Yeah. She's just, she doesn't even hear him out. Like he tried to do the thing. She asked him and the he guy she asked died. him to go easy on, tried to murder him. And then everyone goes him into fighting him. Like, I, come on, Miriam. Or the yeah. moment when uh, the workers are not getting paid and they're like, we're not going to work if we're not getting paid. Oh, yeah. And, she, and she's like, why Why don't you work for the country? They were, don't Do you love the country? For America. And like, I get what they're, they're angling out with like the patriotism, but also like working for free is, is not work. It's yeah. something else. Uh, and then the, yeah, the close up on one of the other characters. Uh, and again, speaking of the melting pot, you have the, um, the Mexican guy and he's like, all right, I'll do it for a lady. I'm like, really? Oh yeah. Him and the Italian guy to like together. Yeah. 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 And then our, the leading guy too, he was, so if we're talking, we're talking looks for leading men a lot, but this guy, he is, I mean, he looks like Lee Pace, first of all. Um, and then he has yeah, moments at that. the end where he's in his black. Uh, he's like where the railroad has come together. And oh, he's yeah. standing at on the, the railroad end. in his yeah. black shirt and his slicked back hair and his eyeliner. It looks like Elvis or Marlon Brando in his hair yeah. or something. Yeah, he's just very clear. It looks like a pickup they shot and they didn't have wardrobe on hand. <laughs> but it's just like that's what he wears but it's so cool that they're like we can shoot this this is gonna work yeah they're like it has rolled up sleeves it looks western you do you do notice that a lot in these uh movies uh, especially the silent era of westerns that the um the side characters look more of the period than the main characters because the main characters have this big like these this very exaggerated silent era makeup which if you didn't know, it tends to be more exaggerated, very heavy eyeliner, big like lip Powder liner, their face or to get rid of every shadow. Oh yeah. Well that, yeah, exactly. Get rid of every shadow. We talked about before how early uh, sound needed a lot of light. Well, to get the actor's face to really show up and the expressions to show up, they had to cake that makeup on. Oh, so uh, to make them as shiny as possible <laughs> and get rid of or all just the shadows. Flat. Some of them just look weird because they look like mimes. It kind of looks like aliens at points. It's really, it's a little disconcerting. It looks a little unreal. But I think because it's so focused on leads, you typically see every all the side characters with less focus on their face come across as more of the period if, when yeah. they're doing a period piece where people are supposed to be dirty or, um, or, or sweaty or dusty because they're working on a railroad. And then the the main characters with their focused makeup and star makeup just look out of place. You actually, you kind of see the similar thing in modern day movies. Um, I saw some people rip at uh, some of the more recent Jurassic World movies because like these archaeologists who are supposed to be like digging in dirt or something look perfectly clean. And it looks oh, weird, yeah. but it's just because it's a star. So they try yeah. to make the star you can look find as nice that. as possible all the time you can find clips of scenes where an actor's just like been thrown in the dirt but the makeup is perfect or they're dying but they have their eyes done or whatever yeah yeah but this is i mean this is such a well-done western and john ford himself would go on to have such a big career 
I feel like you can find parts of future West Westerns all over this movie, like yeah. different, the revenge plot, the romance plot, the, um, the conflict with native Americans plot, the, the immigration plots, they're all there and they all stand out. Um, they're all really interestingly done and have depth to them. Uh, and actually the two things that popped into my head the most, I think it's because this is such a big movie that's almost bigger than one movie and it feels almost like episodic in a way and it's covering so many characters actually western tv shows um two mm -hmm. modern examples that i really liked that actually reminded me a lot of this were deadwood especially down to like the conniving saloon owner and stuff like that really reminded me of that um and then of course i had to hell on wheels which was an amc show i don't think i finished it i think i left off when they got into some Mormon war stuff, uh, which was a historical thing that kind of happened. Um, and just because I didn't have access to Even AMC Even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle knows about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. Yeah, it was the whole weird second half of the, the, uh, the room studying Scarlet. Scarlet. Um, but Hell on Wheels is actually in this movie. They, they name it, and Hell on Wheels, the show, is about this, um, this traveling town that kind of follows the construction of the railroad and you see it move multiple times over the course of this movie. Uh, and you can just hear Alec Guinness saying, I've never seen such a den of what's he, what's he say about Moss Eisley? Uh, such a den of filth and villainy. Yeah. Something like that. But it's basically, I mean, it's basically Moss Eisley on a train. Yeah. This movie movie is really fun. Uh, we should talk about the, um, the camera work because it's one of yes. the things that it's always talked about with John Ford and it's really on display here. It is outstanding. He put friggin' cameras under a Buffalo stampede. Yeah, that one was he pretty impressive. He had his impressive. little GoPros or whatever. He just stuck a camera in the ground and was like, drive those Buffaloes over my camera. It's probably yeah, how did cost that look so much money to replace it. But <laughs> how did that look better than like modern day, like action cameras? Because it, it's like instead of putting a GoPro in your action scene, which is usually what they do, and they cut to it for two seconds and hope you don't notice, it's like he put his red camera in the car that's being flipped over. Yeah. Yeah, the color science was much simpler back then, but because of that, everything matched because there was no color science. It was there just was black no and white. There was no cheap cameras. There was just your good cameras. Yeah. Simpler times. I like it. Yeah. Man, nowadays, man, the number of action cameras I've I've had to color to match in my job, uh, not my current job, but it's the job I've had in the past, where it's just like the DPs, like A7 that they threw in the back of a car, yep. and they're like, match this to the Ari. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you want me to match this to Alexa? I can yeah. kind of do it. It's not gonna. Just monochrome. It's so easy. Um, exactly. But yeah, exactly. I mean, between the the action cam shots, uh, like I already mentioned, the tracking shots of the horses where they probably just straight up used the rails from the railroad and and like chugged the cameras alongside the horses. It's um, called tracking for a reason, man. It's called tracking for a reason. And the close ups, the beauty shots. I mean, this is you can see where um, this is before auteur theory was a thing but you can see why someone could watch a movie like sky high and then watch a movie like the iron horse and be like this guy gets it like john ford is a director and whoever the heck uh lynn reynolds is like you know he's a movie maker or a cameraman like you're saying like they would just you you have a camera you go like tell people to do some stuff and uh we'll sell it uh john ford is like we're making a story we're not just making a movie uh, especially yeah. at a time when movie was literally just, it's a picture that moves. It's like, this is, this is a story. I mean, even his early shots of like the kids playing in the snow, like just the framing and the composition oh, yeah. was already telling a story. I do want to mention that um, if you, a lot of people are inspired by uh, John Ford's uh, photography. He's famously very good at capturing landscapes and a lot of people, including like Kurosawa uh, kind of, studied his art and incorporated it into their own style in addition <laughs> to watching his uh, <laughs> yes uh, in addition to watching uh, ford's movies 
Uh, another great way to study would be by looking at some of the famous American painters of the American West who I couldn't find anything concretely saying that they influenced Ford, but I have a hard time imagining they didn't um, to some way, shape or form. Uh, the two, the two sources I'll mention are Albert uh, Bierstadt, who is a German American painter uh, who painted just gorgeous, gorgeous uh, American landscapes. And his use of light is very similar to the way Ford captures light, especially at golden hour. And then of course the Hudson river school, who was also very good at capturing landscapes and specifically the one shot that stands out for me in this movie that reminds me of that is the first shot we see of Davy and his father looking at the, uh, the past that kind of formed oh, yeah. like a central plot point of the movie. Mm hmm. With that, let's slide on in to overall notes. All right. So, westerns, but not yet, really. I mean, like we've been saying, there's a lot forming here, but a lot of times, like, when you watch these, they 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 have kind of a passing resemblance to westerns, or at least to the stock western ideas that we have, which is... It's super interesting because you can't deny that they are Westerns, but Western films have kind of created their own niche that's so separate from what they started as. Yeah, yeah. We're essentially seeing a period of development here. Um, and, you know, one of the ways to get really good at something or to really develop an idea is essentially to iterate over it. And that's what we're seeing here. I mean, we mentioned before how, like, Tom Mix alone starred in 80-something silent era pictures of Westerns in the 1920s. And that's the kind of number that kind of lets you sort through what works and what doesn't work in a Western by just going over like a bajillion different ideas, um, which is also ironically kind of similar to how I just learned like you to make AI, AI learning bots just by iterating, <laughs> iterating over them really fast and like yeah. throwing out the ones that don't work and taking the ones that do work. So, you know, machine learning, but for for uh, filmmakers in the 1920s. And you can see like elements of it, like we talked about the thematic elements of the, um, of, the uh, of, t of testing block and the action elements and setting elements of Sky High and how those could definitely become part of what we think now of the classic Western genre um, but maybe weren't fully formed at that point. Um, the other thing that we haven't mentioned yet, but I do really want to point out, is uh, kind of like this legendary aspect of the Western. Um, mm -hmm. And we talked about how it kind of grew out of legends and uh, pop culture of the American West. But I mean that on a grander scale, almost like a Tolkien-esque scale of like adapting mythology. Uh, because one of the genres that, especially these early Westerns really remind me of is fantasy um, with the way people have codes of honor and fit into stereotypes. And there's little villages that you travel in between and big cities and these wide open areas that are filled with people or creatures that might want to kill or hurt you. Um, and I think that ne doesn't necessarily hint at like origins within fantasy itself. Fantasy as a popular genre wasn't really quite there yet in the 1920s. It was coming along, but it was more of like in the myth and folktale era then. Um, but it really hints at like where these legends and nationalistic legends, especially kind of herald from uh, the tradition of like chivalric legend and like legends from yeah. the medieval era. That I were can definitely see how. chivalry and like Arthurian kind of threads. Yeah. And you see the same kind of thing back in back in those stories with you know heroic knights or fallen knights or uh, outlaws with a heart of gold like Robin Hood, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of see all damsels in distress. They all play into this action. I mean, just look at like the a little um, bit less wizards, but other than that. <laughs> there's definitely fewer wizards. Um, although maybe not to a certain extent, you do have guns that could easily be in situations. Guns or diamond could easily fill in as like a replacement for um for magic to a certain extent, or the development yeah, of technology when, when it's guns versus bows and arrows and that kind of stuff. Yeah, or the introduction of this giant magical iron horse into the uh, the American yeah. West that's going to cinch it all up like it's planning on it. Um, 
but yeah, you can you can see how that that kind of heralds from that, and that's kind of where I think the genre kind of departs from like the historical elements of it. It really is like, you know, Westworld is a pretty good example of it. That's maybe a bit too specific, but the Western genre as a whole is already kind of a theme park that's based off of a historical era more yeah. than it is any kind of depiction of actual history. There's even, some <laughs> even in the Iron Horse, which let me confirm this real quick. So here's the first inner title. Accurate and faithful in every particular of fact and atmosphere is this pictorial history of the building of the first transcontinental railroad. And if that doesn't sound like a museum, first of all, uh, yeah. I don't know what does. Second yeah, it of feels all, like you're trying to sell me something. Second of all, they straight up lied. <laughs> At the end, they show the joining of the railroad and the two rail cars from the east and the west. Um, and it, there's a title card that says, these are the original uh, Union Pacific number oh, one yeah. one one nine and Jupiter, and that's not true. Like the film tells you, this is true in every particular, and these are the first. These are the original train cars, but it's not. They were scrapped like ten or fifteen years before the film started. Yeah, and, uh, it's it's a really weird choice. It just feels like the the studio is like selling you something, and it's weird to put that kind of lie like that deep into the movie, like. <laughs> But like speaking why? of like creating like a mythology, how else do you create a mythology than just straight up lying about the veracity of it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or or like other stuff that's just like convenient, like introducing the plane into the um right. into the Tom Mix movie. It's like I thought this was supposed to be taking place in like the old west. Why is there a plane? <laughs> yeah, right. But again, now it's like now a plane is a mythology of this this west world that is film westerns you know there you know now it's a tall tale right there was an airplane that flew through the grand canyon airplanes weren't invented yet this is part of the it was a magical airplane you know whatever yeah yeah your dragon flying through the canyon it's part of the mythology of the west now that somehow there was an airplane before there were airplanes yeah it's 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 definitely an odd there, there's a lot of like un inaccurate pieces that aren't real but also you know that's just kind of part of like making a genre there's a lot of genres that just aren't real i think westerns might feel a little disingenuous because they're supposedly based off of a quote-unquote historical era mm -hmm. but you know yeah we didn't even talk about buffalo bill is in the iron horse and oh, uh, yeah. as, a, as a character but like yeah. we said buffalo bill was still active around this time or he was like in very recent living memory and uh he's already become this like they don't even he's not a big part of the film but the fact that they just throw his name in there and he's like he's kind of the cool side character who's just like every time he's on screen he's doing something awesome uh, just feels like a yeah like a cameo yeah but he's already become a legend and granted he turned himself into a legend uh yeah. but he's part of you know he's if you know, he's the Merlin of the West or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, then it's we're getting more like those are still being developed. You've got Butch Cassidy, who hasn't quite become a legend because he's still active, but he's getting there. And you've got all of these uh, characters that turn into the heraldry of the West. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Buffalo Bill is a very good example in and of his own right. Right. Because he was he was this Wild West guy. He was this big hunter. He did supply Buffalo to the uh, workers of the of the railroad. That's how he got his name, Buffalo Bill. Mm -hmm. As a sharpshooter. Because um, his name was something boring. They even said it in the movie. What was his yeah. <laughs> actual name? I mean, it's Bill, so... No, it Bill. wasn't. His name wasn't Bill. It was Cody. William, oh, yeah. Oh, no. Okay, it is. It's William Frederick Cody. Be Buffalo okay. Bill. But, yeah, I oh, mean, I how much more Buffalo boring and I got is that? the Wild Wings, not the guy. Oops. Um... He actually what? looks like uh, K the KFC guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Buffalo Bill is such a good example because he was genuinely like, and he, not just like, he was an Old West character. He was a guy out doing these things that these stories are about. And then he stopped being that to become an Old West myth maker mm -hmm. um, and sold his own story. And as we all know, especially in Hollywood, when you're selling stump something, the truth isn't always in your favor. 
uh, for better or for worse. So it was all about the fact that we're dancing around this, but we have a film next time that's literally going to deal with the exact thing we're talking about. Do we? We do. That's oh yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> that's do. That's the whole point of one of our films next time. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but you know, speaking of business, you can even see like how big of a business westerns were and why they were being made uh, was because it was big business. They were super popular. Hollywood made a ton of them during the silent era, um, and you can see more and more money go into them, even just over the course of like we have a movie today from. 1920 i think is the first one right Mm -hmm. Uh, the testing block to 1925 and look at the scale of the testing block versus the scale of the iron horse oh yeah Um, i mean the iron horse is a bit of a special case because it's a planned studio epic but still like that's a huge uptick like the scale of growth in hollywood during the 1920s is sometimes hard to like really like grasp but it was big it was really explosive that's when like the Los Angeles, as we think of it today, really kind of became a big city as we think of it now. Um, and not just a movie colony in its own right. Uh, so yeah, this is this is a huge deal and not just Western history, but Hollywood history as well. And as you can see, we have all these building blocks now and we've ended on John Ford, who is like the king of the Westerns, um, as well as just a really solid director all around. And we've never actually done an episode just on John Ford before, Jonathan. But not yet. We're about to. What are we talking about next time on the podcast? Well, you may have a suspicion. We're talking about John Ford. Um, So we're going to talk about, we've already talked about one John Ford film before, which was uh, Stagecoach. And uh, we're going to be kind of diving into the films that made him you know, someone that the French would take notice of as one of the auteurs that spoilers Akira Kurosawa would take notice of as one of the great filmmakers of the early age. And uh, so we've got some of his biggest films coming up, starting with My Darling Clementine from 1946, then The Searchers from 1956, and finally The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance from 1962. Yeah. It actually drives me crazy because like I feel like every at least once a week I get an ad for some article that's like, did you know that uh, American Westerns were influenced by the work of Akira Kurosawa? I'm like, yeah, I did know that. (laughs) But did you know Akira Kurosawa was influenced by American Westerns like John John Ford? Ford. It's all a circle, my guys. It's all a circle. And we'll we'll. I'm, I will probably bring up this tidbit multiple times, but I just love in Akira Kurosawa's autobiography, he talks about John Ford like a giddy schoolgirl. Like, <laughs> he's so in love with John Ford. There was one time that John Ford came to one of his sets or something, and he missed it, and he was devastated. It's just oh, hilarious. Oh, no. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. Like, I knew that Kurosawa was definitely into John Ford's work. I didn't realize that, like, they had a chance to meet. That's pretty cool actually maybe they did meet or something he made a big deal about this time that john ford came to the studio and i want to say he missed it and was so sad about it um, well we will have, he just like didn't know what to say to him it's just hilarious yeah we will have a very good opportunity to talk about ford and kurosawa over the coming episodes it all connects together that's one of the reasons why i'm so excited to do these courses uh for filmlings is to kind of draw we, we talk about these threads that connect all these different parts of film history and film movements all the time mm-hmm. and it gives us a chance to kind of really connect those threads from uh, from month to month and show to show. So I'm excited to talk about that and piece that all together. And um, you know, if you have if if you're like if you like the courses uh, outline as as we go through it, or you have more stuff about westerns that you want to know about, or you want us to watch or check out, hit us up in the Discord and yeah. let us give us recommendations. Let us know what you think, and we would be happy, more than happy, to talk movies with you. And if you need uh, a tide over, uh, we have a whole series about westerns and uh, samurai films. So Man, we've done so many. Out. We've done so many episodes now. You can check out so many episodes. This so, podcast has so many episodes in it. Oh just man! Go to the blog and search westerns in the search bar, and you get a you'll bunch. Find, you'll find a lot, and, and as well as curse out movies. But that's about all the time we have for this episode.
To find links to things that we talked about today, as well as a complete list of past episodes and all 453 films we've covered so far, visit thefilmlinks.com. And you can also join us for ongoing film discussions on our Discord server. And to stay posted about upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at The Filmlinks. Summaries from this episode were recorded by me, Blue Jay. You can find me on Twitter at the Blue Jay 1994 If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. The Iron Horse, brought to you by Panda Express. And now I want some Panda Express. I have to go get that after this. But We just had Panda Express like two days ago. Dude, I love Panda Express so much. It's, it's one of those things that's like, we need to eat out. Like, I, will, I could eat Panda or Cane's like every single time. Dude, they opened up a Cane's here and people lost their minds. Is it, it like is, when they opened In-N-Out in Frisco? Yes, it is exactly that. Like, there are... It, originally, it was actual cops, but now it's like they're private, like, traffic people. Yeah, security. Who just kind of dress like cops. Um, who just guide traffic up and down the street. It's like a major street here too in Burbank. That's almost like just an absolute Halted. cluster just because everybody wants to go get canes. But yeah, it is, It people are just acting like fools over there. It is absolutely wild. Like I kind of want to go get it, but not until it calms down. I love that information. I'm so glad I know that. <laughs> it was exactly like when In-N-Out <laughs> opened up in Frisco though. It was, it, it's really funny that I saw both ends of that.